start recording. All right, so we are recording. Um, I am going to move a few windows to the side where you can see. All right, this is the first one. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you I forgot yet another thing. I forgot the stylist that is supposed to go with this. So it's okay. I can still go over this part, except you know, I can't do any more than that. All right. So remember what we talked about on Monday? You are going to analyze the probability of a team that is going to lose for certain because there are three, all three salty people out of 10 are on one particular team in, let's say, League of Legends. Okay, so that team is guaranteed to lose, you know, even if they have, you know, like super duper players. <clears throat> so the question is, how do we formulate the problem? So when we look at one element in Omega, it's going to look like this. So each element of Omega is a two tuple, where the first of the two tuple is a set, and the second of the two tuple is also a set because each set is representing a team. So you have team A and you have team B, and within a team it is a set because it doesn't really matter what the ordering is. So we are not considering you know, the, the salty person can only be the assassin or the salty person can only be the healer or whatever. Okay, so any, any role, you know, as long as there's a salty person, it's a salty person. So is that okay? Does everybody understand the format of an element of Omega? Are we good? Okay. Two teams. Each team has five people. And you know, within a team, it is a set because we don't really care about who is playing which role. So that means, yeah, as long as we know this person is, is a part of that team, that's all we need to know. Membership. So when we look at the event set, okay, this is the event set. Each element of the event set is going to look exactly the same in terms of format as an element of the omega. That should not be surprising because the event set is supposed to be a subset of omega. So that means, you know, well, I mean, we are only looking at members of the of omega, and they can also be member of you know the event set. So S1, S2, S3 represent the three salty people. So these two, this particular Two tuple belongs to the event set because we want to look at the probability of all three salty people on one particular team. Does that make sense? No, but I did not say anything about, well, should they be on team A or should they be on team B? So that means this versus this are two distinct elements because you can have all three salty people on, in team A, but you can also have all three salty people on team B they are considered two distinct cases when we are counting. Is that part okay? All right, so now we are going to you know, do some analysis. So the first question is how many things do we have in Omega itself? When we look at the entire experiment, how many elements do we have in the entire, how many outcomes do we have for the entire experiment? So that turns out to be 10 choose five because once you determine, you know, so let's just say that we start with team A, okay, we, out of 10 people. So we pick, okay, you know, here's the first person, you know, you go to team A. Pick the second person, you go to team A, and so on. So once we have all five people chosen for team A, do I have to do anything for team B? There's no degree of freedom left for team B because I only have five people left. So team B is going to end up with those five people. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's why it is only 10 choose five and not 10 choose five and then 10 choose five. Now, if you want to, you can multiply that as your know, 10 choose five times five choose five. That's perfectly okay because from the logical perspective, the first team, whether it's team A or B does not matter. We start with 10 people and we want to choose only five. When it gets to the second team, we have five people to choose from, but the team is going to need all five people anyway. So you have five choose five. What is five choose five? It's one. Very good. Okay, I'm glad you guys are paying attention so that you, you know that 
five choose zero is always one. Five choose five is always just one as well. N choose N is always one. Excellent. So now we want to look at the number of elements in the event set, okay? So the, the way we do this calculation is we focus on one team first, okay? So we just put our attention to team A and ask, okay, so what are the chances or what, how many ways can we choose all three salty people on team A? So we try to answer that question first. So that means all three salty people, we're gonna choose all of them because they are all gonna end up in team A. But team A, like team B, has five positions. So the three salty people would, would take up only three out of five slots. We got two more people left. So now you have, to, you have to think about, where do we get those two other people? Well, out of the seven non-salty people. Is that okay? All right. Does this remind you of a problem that we have solved using about the same kind of reasoning? It should remind you of the no. lotto. It's the lotto problem. It's the same thing as the lotto problem, where we only want three out of the five numbers as the winning numbers. The other two, we don't care, because you're only interested in getting eight bucks out of the two dollars that you, you spent to buy the ticket. So it's the same kind of problem. So five choose, I mean, three choose three times seven choose two, is going to give you the number of ways to fill up team A with all three salty people. But we already know that we also include, we also want to include you know, what happens if team B ends up with all three salty people. So that's why you have to multiply, multiply by two because you know, there are the same number of ways for team B to end up with all three salty people. So are we good with this? particular answer? I don't have the numerical answer. Does in, is anyone interested? Just in case, you know, you're going to go home and, you know, now that I mentioned and remind you guys, you know, some of you are going like, oh, that, that, that's right. I have to go play my League of Legends. I have not been touching my, that account for a while. <laughs> All right. Well, we can actually do this to, we can actually do this calculation. So let me put this tab on this side. Here we go. And then I'll go to my drive. You know, I'm, I'll put this into the shared folder. So this way, after class, you guys can all go in there and kind of check it out, which I think is a good idea. All right, so we are going to put it here. And this is going to be a new Google Sheets. And I'll just name it after today's date. That makes it like easy to find because it's going to be the same name as the video itself. 2024, April 24th. There we go. There we go. All right. So I'm just going to put in the cardinality of omega. And that is Combin 10.5 because there are 10 people of which we have to choose five people on one team, the remaining five are on the other team. So if you want it to be more complete, that's fine too, okay? Because it doesn't change anything, but it quote unquote makes more sense. All right, so now we want to look at the event set, um, <clears throat> the cardinality of the event set, which is what we talked about a little bit earlier. So I know this is you know, one, but it does make sense to kind of mention it because we want all three salty people to be all chosen in a particular team. Then we have to look at, okay, what about the rest of the team? Let's choose two out of the seven non-salty people for the rest of the team and then multiply by two because I don't care which team ends up with the three salty people. I just want to know, you know what are the chances that one team is guaranteed to lose because they got all three salty people. So now we have 42. So the probability is the ratio between the two. So the probability is the uh, cardinality of the event set divided by the cardinality of omega. And the chances is 16.7% basically. All right, so do we have any questions about you know, answering this particular question? Yes. 
It's the number of teams, yes. Yeah, because it, because the question is, you know, what are the chances that one team, one of the two teams, so it can be team A, can also be team B. If the question is specifically saying, you know, what are the probability that a team A ends up with all three salty people, then you would not have the multiplication by two. All right, any other questions? So does this help? You know, does this help you to kind of, kind of, formulate your own process of how to go about analyzing these problems and how to apply the you know, kind of equations and also the formulae in order to solve the problem. Okay, all right. So there are a lot of real life you know, uh, examples, you know, just like you know, this one. Um, every time, I mean, if you play Dungeons and Dragons or any card game, you know, there are a lot of opportunities to apply you know, what we are talking about here. The key is to make simplify the problem because if you have like you know 78 cards like this and 60 cards like that, those are large numbers. So you want to reduce the number to something that's that you can easily kind of go like, oh, okay, these are all the possible choices. Then you can then abstract the method and then reapply that abstracted method to the larger problem set. All right, so this is something that we talked about last week and I mean on Monday, <clears throat> but this is the main concept that we were talking about on Monday, which is um, the analysis of time complexity when we run the algorithms and we want to be able to compare the time complexities of different algorithms. Um, so that's, this is where we left off last time. So when we left off last time, we were talking about the limit of a sequence. Are there any questions about section 3.3, .3, which is basically where we left off on Monday? Well, I'm, yes, go ahead. Correct. So um, I used one particular example. I forgot to bring my stylus, but it's okay because I can still go back to the previous slide and point to it. So let me do just that. All right. Okay, so this is the graph that I gave you guys last time. So the idea is for every um, epsilon that I choose, epsilon is a real number, it doesn't have to be an integer. So for every epsilon that I choose, which is a non-negative real, non-negative, non-zero real number, um, I can always choose an m, which is an integer, which is a natural number. So that x of m and everything to the right-hand side of x of m, they're all within epsilon away from k, and k is the limit of the entire sequence. So. That's kind of how the limit of the sequence is defined. In this case, the limit of the sequence is simply you know, known as k, just so that I can refer to it easily. So that was what we talked about on Monday. Do we have any questions about this particular diagram? Particularly, there are three numerical values. What is k, what is epsilon, and what is m? And then we have individual values. So because this is, because we are not talking about calculus where you know, this is going to be a continuous curve, we are talking about a sequence. So that means you know, there are discrete points along this curve where you know, there's x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on and so forth. So we are basically looking at, okay, does this curve, does this sequence have a particular property that the limit exists? the limit of the sequence exists. The limit of the sequence is a particular real number, k, so that you know, if you give me any non-zero, non-negative epsilon, I can always find you an m, so that x of m, x of m plus one, x of m plus two, and everything on that side of m are always going to be within epsilon away from k. Now, can it be above k? Yeah. It, can it be under k? Yes. But eventually they quote unquote approach K, which means you know they get closer and closer to K 
So you can give me a smaller and smaller epsilon as long as it is non-zero and non-negative. I can find u and m to satisfy this requirement. So uh, are there any questions about that concept? No questions? Okay. <clears throat> so without any questions about that, we are going to move on and talk about why a limit of a sequence sometimes is not going to be the best thing to do when we are looking at the tendency of the time complexity of an algorithm. So what we're going to do is to define x of i as negative 1, the whole thing, to the power of i. So that is not a very complicated thing, right? Because you know, x of 0 is 1, x of 1 is negative 1, x of 2 is 0 again, x of 3 is negative 1 again, and so on. In other words, this particular sequence is just alternating between 1 and negative 1. It's not even going to get large, okay? But because of that, a limit does not exist, okay? So how do I know that a limit does not exist? If you say, if you claim, okay, this particular value is the limit, I can always find you an epsilon so that you go like, oh, man, you know, that requirement for the epsilon doesn't work. I cannot find an index so that everything to the right-hand side of that particular index is going to be within epsilon away from the limit because the limit fluctuates between, not the limit, excuse me, the values between, you know, fluctuates between one and negative one, and it goes on forever. So to mitigate this problem, because if there are some functions or fun some sequences like this, so we are going to introduce a more complex, you know, kind of way to look at the behavior or the asymptotic behavior of a sequence. It's called limit superior, and there's a matching um, one that's called limit inferior. But once we understand limit superior, you know, the other one is like, oh, okay, it's just the flip side. So the way we define limit superior or lim sup is limit superior as n approaches to infinity x of n is defined to be, uh, what is that again? This is uh, inf and sup are terms that we have defined on Monday by themselves. So what is inf, I-N-F? Infimum, mm -hmm. infimum, and then sup is supimum. So I also mentioned something like if you're dealing with real numbers, uh, these are actually pretty easy to understand terms and how, why are they easy to understand when we are dealing with real numbers and what exactly do they map to? Let's start, let's start with infimum. It maps to a really easy concept that all of you have known for years already. And what is that? Minimum, very good. And supremum is going to be maximum, exactly. So given that is the case, okay, so you can basically go to my notes here, cross out every single infimum and say minimum, and cross out every supremum and say maximum, okay? That makes it easier for you guys to go like, oh, okay, I know what that is. But even with that, what exactly is the limit superior? We have a nested kind of thing. So this is maximum, right? So we are looking at the maximum of x of k where k is greater than or equal to n, and n is the one thing that is approaching to infinity. So don't think about approach to infinity yet. You just give yourself a concrete number, 10, okay? So what does that mean when n equals to 10 and we're trying to figure out this quantity? That means starting with x10, okay? What is, it with, it, with this part here, it is asking um, what is the maximum of all the numbers, x of 10, x of 11, x of 12, and so on and so forth. Is that okay? In other words, we are only looking at just this part here, and n is 10, n is a concrete number 10. Is that okay? So we are looking, so now we can have a sequence that can fluctuate all it wants, and, or it doesn't fluctuate, doesn't matter, okay? We are picking n to be 10, like right here, and then we are asking everything after this, 
What is the maximum? That's all we're asking. Is that okay? <clears throat> but this thing is nested into something else. So it is nested in um, here into the infinum. So it is nested within the infimum, which is minimum. So which is asking, so what is the minimum of all of those things where as long as n is greater than or equal to zero? So this may require a little bit of um, an example probably will help to illustrate it. So let me go ahead and illustrate it with an example. And I'm going to put it into the Google Sheets of today because I think that's just the logical way to do it. So I'm going to use a new sheet to demonstrate this. And I'll give you the sequence of x. Um, you guys can help me choose different values. Or I can just you know, plant your know, randomized numbers here. 56, 4, 7, 8. Now, these numbers can be real numbers, OK? So we can have negative 6, 7, 10, and then back to 2, negative 7, 800, 2, 6, 67, 8, 10, and so on, OK? So let's assume that you know this is x0 and it's going on like this, okay? So these are the later ones. Now obviously this sequence does end at you know a particular value. So it's not exactly the same thing as in the example, okay? But I'm just illustrating you know what what we are dealing with here. So if we want to find the quote unquote limit superior of this sequence, pretending that everything after this is 10, okay? So just pretend. Is that okay? All right. So what does it mean? Well, it means that we are looking at this and we are asking what, okay, so I'm going to say this is the, going to be the um, maximum. Okay, let me go back to the definition because I, I cannot remember the definition. So we'll go back to the definition. We are looking at the maximum first and then we find the minimum of the maximums. Okay, so now we go back to the spreadsheet. And we say, this is just the maximum of this. Is that okay? And then this is going to be the maximum of that and the one before. So it's going to be the maximum of these two. Is that okay? And then this is going to be the maximum of the three and the one before, and so on. Are we still uh, are we understanding how these numbers come along? So obviously, if I were to do this by hand, it's going to be it's not a whole lot of fun, right? So we are going to use um, an interesting feature of Google Sheets, which I suspect is also in Excel, to say I'm going to make the range dynamic, okay? Depending on the actual, in this case, column number of the cell that I need to figure out, okay? So let's see what we can do here. We are trying to f figure out the maximum of a particular range of values. So there is such, such a thing called offset, which is kind of like a misnomer, because offset allows you to specify a range of cells where the beginning and the end can be dynamic. So that's kind of cool. So in this case, oh, this is going to be this is going to be difficult because the way it works is um, you can control the height and the width, but they are starting with the beginning cell, but not the end of the range. So it's harder to specify the end of the range. So I might need to do some awful tricks here, which is. Um, I have to use address and reference. So let's end up. All right, so I have to do this step by step. <laughs> There's a thing called an address, which allows you to formulate using the row as a number and also the column as a number. And then it becomes a cell reference. So let's go ahead and work this part out first. So in this case, the this is the start. This is the start of this particular maximum. This is the start of this maximum. This is the start of this maximum. So it is natural that this becomes the start of this particular cell. 
So that means if I need to come up with the row number based on the column number, that's going to be a constant of some kind. I'm going to say 20 minus the column number of this particular cell. So we'll, we'll just kind of work out the math here. So 20 minus the column number. This is minus 5 because this is column 5. So 15 minus 5, 20 minus 5 is 15, which is one off from where we need to go. So I can change the 20 to 19, okay? And then the column number is easy because that's a constant. We just want column 1 because column A contains all the values that we need to reference. So we'll take a look at this and say, you know, okay, what are you referring to? A14, okay, which is here. That's not what we want because this is here, this is here, this is here. So we want A16. So I think I messed up my math a little bit here. So instead of subtracting one from 20, I should have added one. So there we go, 16. Huh, okay, that seems right. All right, so this is just you're know, looking at the address. So now I can see if I can use offset and the address, okay, we'll, we'll say 0011 and it doesn't like it because it is considered a string. So that means you know, the address is not going to work. I have to dereference the address also. So it has to be, and I cannot remember how to do that. So I'm going to look it up. <laughs> Google Sheets D reference and address. There we go. Indirect, that's it. All right, so we have to put it indirect here. I'm not sure whether that's going to work, but we'll find out. Yes, that works. Okay, so you can think about address as a way to construct an actual address in C or C++. In other words, it's equivalent to typecasting an integer into an address of some sort. Okay, that's what address is doing. Indirect is a dereference, which is known as the asterisk operator, the uni, the mono, un, unary. Okay, it's the unary asterisk you know, operator. So that's how this works. Okay, very good. So now I can specify you know, a reference, and the only thing left for me to now specify is the height, because the height should also you know, correspond to the column number itself. So it would be the column number, I think, minus one. Yes, okay, so I think it should be minus one. But the minus is not there yet. There we go. Um, oh, okay. Why do we have here? Oh, that's just your, okay, that's, okay, I know what it's doing. <clears throat> So if I were to move this cell over a little bit, it is, you know, it's basically just you know, giving me the range of values you know, where you know, I'm trying to take the maximum of. So that means you know, the, the way I specify the offset is working. So now I can you know, then you know, say, let's find the maximum of that. Okay. So. Now, this is also a 10 because if, when you look at this portion of the sequence, 8, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, I mean, the, the maximum is obviously 10. So the next one would tell us kind of whether this works correct, uh, correctly or not. Because if I extend this one more, what should be here? 67, okay? So this would be a good way to test whether the code is working or not. Oh, okay, I grow in the opposite direction. There we go. Yes. Okay. So I just have to extend it until we get to, you know, the, the 50. I mean, beyond a certain point, it's not going to make any difference because as long as 800 is included, it's going to be all 800, right? <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and 
just kind of do that, Woo, like that. And you know, this is like you know, too much already, that's why. There we go. All right. So does that help answer the question? And then we are trying to find the minimum of these cells. That becomes the limit superior. It's basically the minimum of the maximums. What maximums are we talking about? The maximum with a different starting point of the sequence. Is that okay? Are we good? Cool. So what do you think the limit inferior is? Flip maximum to minimum and flip minimum to maximum and that becomes limit inferior. Are we still doing okay so far with this? Maybe a little bit? Okay. The other way to help understand this is graphical because some people are extremely uh, visual. So this will help. So insert, um, I think we want a chart. There we go. Um, no, that is not what we want. We want, that's not it. Okay, so if you, okay, let me see if I can actually make a chart out of this. Drawing, no image, paper table, no, has to be a chart. But I have to control the chart type. So we should be looking at a line chart. Okay, that's good, okay. All right, so when we look at a chart, I think it's a little bit easier to understand. So the maximum, each maximum, is saying, okay, I'm starting from here. What is the maximum starting from here all the way to the end of the entire sequence, which in this case, it goes to infinity. And so I'm looking all, at all the maximums, maximum from here, maximum from here, maximum from here, maximum from here, maximum, and then maximum from here, maximum from here. And then this kind of sets up the entire thing because you know, the maximum from here is 800. But if I move the starting point any earlier than this point, they're all gonna be 800s. So now I look at all the maximums and I ask, what is the minimum of the maximums? So in this case, the minimum of the maximums is going to be this point here. Does that make sense? Because when we are looking at all the maximums, this is uh, the entire thing. So if we are to make another chart out of the, the maximums, okay, so we are looking at the chart, uh, okay, it's going to be sort of backwards. But if we make a chart out of the maximums, and then we look at the minimum of the maximums, that is going to be the 10. The 10 is the minimum of the maximums. Is that okay? So 10 in this case, if we pretend everything after this are all 10s, then 10 is going to be the uh, limit superior of this particular diagram or curve. Is that okay? So let's go back to that thing that alternates between, between one and negative one. What is the limit superior of that particular sequence? It goes like one, negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one. So what is the uh, limit superior of that thing? So when you look at the maximums, okay, the maximums will alternate, uh, would be, the maximum's gonna be one and one, 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 okay? Because you know, it, it goes to infinity. So all the maximums are ones. What is the minimum of all, of basically all ones? One, okay? So that would be the limit superior, okay? What do you think is the limit inferior? Even though we haven't really talked about limit inferior, but it's the flip side. It'll be negative one. In other words, limit superior and limit inferior forms an envelope around the actual sequence. So that envelope is going to say, okay, as the sequence continues to go on to infinity, this envelope is going to enclose the values of that sequence. In other words, instead of looking at a single value that the curve is converging into, we're looking at a range of values that will contain 
all the values of the sequence starting at a certain point. Is that okay or not? We are, in, in plainer terms, we are looking at the upper bound and the lower bound of the sequence as the sequence goes on to infinity. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Upper bound and lower bound. All right. So I'm going to leave the spreadsheet up here, okay, you know, just so that you guys can play with it. You can change it, you know, any way you want to. For, in, for instance, okay, for those of you who go like, okay, 800 is way too much. We don't want to play with something like that far away from the, the rest of the curve. Go ahead and change it. Change it to an 8 and see what happens, right? If you change that to an 8, you can see that the maximums is going to be 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. And the 67, 67, because once we get to the 67 here, that becomes the maximum because everything before the 67 are less than the 67. Okay, so this is you know you can this is interactive. You can go ahead, make a copy of this spreadsheet. Does everybody know how to make a copy of a Google Sheet? So you go to File, then you go to Make a Copy. And then you specify a place in your own Google Drive, and then just click the button. That will make a copy. Once you have that copy, you can change the, the numerical values and you know, do whatever experiment you want to do to this whole thing. All right? <clears throat> All right, so now we're going to go back to the lecture material. So we now just covered limit superior and limit inferior. So basically, one is the upper limit, or you know, the it's the upper bound of the sequence, and one is the lower bound of the sequence as the sequence approaches infinity. So now we want to look at some actual definition. We'll start with big O. Okay, this is the actual definition of the big O notation. How many people have heard about the big O notation in the context of time complexity of algorithms. Okay, I would expect the entire class to have some exposure because I think that concept was introduced in 400. What, what was the class that taught sorting algorithms? 430 or 400? 430, okay, so 430, and that's why 430 is a, is a co-requisite because these two, the, top, the, the two classes have topics that are intertwined. All right, so what is the big O notation? It is not what you think it is, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> so the big O notation is defined like this. This entire statement here, or I should say statement four, defines what it means to be the big O notation. So as it turns out, the big O notation gives you a set. A set of what? A set of functions. So f of n, f is a function, f of n is an element of big O of g of n if and only if blah, blah, blah is true. Okay, so let me make sure this, this part is clear first. Big O of something gives you a set of functions. So you're basically asking about membership of a function. In this case, g of n typically is a very simple function like if it is um, a constant, then g of n is just one. If it's a linear function, g of n is just n. If it's a square, then g of n is n squared. You can have uh, sorting algorithms where it is n, uh, g of n is n times log of n. You can also have um, binary search where g of n is the log of n. Now you might say, but tech, it, it is specifically the log two of n. No, no, not really, because all log of n are basically equivalent. They're only off by a certain constant. Okay, so the constant is, is not important here. So g of n is a simple function. f of n, on the other hand, is the actual amount of time in order to solve a problem that has n elements in it. So that can be super messy, okay? because it can contain all kinds of terms, 
um, in order to take into consideration. Remember, we talked about DDR technology. So if you want to include that, I mean, you can throw that in and make you know, f of n a super complex algorithm. Okay, but we don't really care about the details. Okay, we just want to look at the general order of magnitude. So f of n is something that is very complex and something that, trust me, we don't want to deal with. We just want to see if whether that is a member of big O of n in this case or not. We just want to know whether there's a member. Okay, it is a member here or not. So f of n is a member of big O of g of n. If and only if the limit superior as n approaches infinity, this part is always the case, okay, when n approaches infinity. In other words, we are looking at the behavior of this ratio when n is large, okay? You know, if I want to put it in super layman's term, that's all we care. Because for very small numbers, it is possible that an inferior algorithm can beat a superior algorithm just because of the amount of time it needs to set up and all kinds of stuff like that. So we only care when n is large, okay? That's basically what happens. That's, that's basically what we meant to say when n approaches infinity is, we only care about the cases when n gets really large. Is that okay? All right. So we are looking at the, this is the absolute value. It is not cardinality because f of n, g of n, they're both returning real numbers. So we are looking at this ratio. As long as this ratio is less than infinity, then we claim that f of n is a member of big O of g of n. Okay, so we're gonna th I'm gonna throw some examples out here. Since my I forgot to bring my uh, stylus, I can only use some other way to illustrate it, and a text editor will suffice in this case. All right, so let's take a look at some examples. So let's say we are looking at a, a very simple algorithm, like um, okay, give me a constant time algorithm. Okay, give me something that's a log n algorithm. I just mentioned one, but I just want to see if you guys paid attention. Give me an algorithm where the time complexity is known to be the log of n. I just mentioned one algorithm like that. Which one was that? Uh, that's sorting. The best sorting algorithms are all n log n. So what algorithm is just log of n? Okay, I'll give you a clue. Yes? Binary search, very good. Okay, so binary search is known to have a time complexity, time complexity of log of n. So I'm gonna define f of n to be the log two of n, okay? Just for simplicity. And I'm gonna call g of n to be n squared, okay? The square of n. So now the question is, is f of n a member of big O of g of n or not? So I'm gonna put a question mark here because it is a question. Is it or is it not? Is it true or false? So what do you think? So if I throw something at you like this in the exam, what are you going to do? What would be the first step that you do? Starts with a D, followed by E, followed by F. Definition, very good. Okay, so we want to look up the definition of membership of the big O notation. By the way, it is not O, it is Omicron, but O is fine, okay? So we look up the definition, which we have right here, okay? So we look at, you know, okay, we, we go like, okay, limit superior, blah, 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 okay? But eventually we're looking at the ratio, right? So we, we say, okay, we have log of two of n divided by the square of n, Take the absolute value, okay? Shouldn't be a problem because they're, they're all non-negative to begin with. So now we look at this and go like, okay. Um, and then I vaguely remember Tech mentioned something about 
n approaches infinity means your n just gets really large. You get larger and larger and larger. We want to find out when n gets really large, what's going to happen. So what do you think is going to happen when you divide the log of n by log 2 of n, to be more specific, by the square of n? As n gets larger and larger, what's going to happen? Yes. Uh, as you get to larger and larger numbers. Yes. Uh, yep. So what do you think is going to be the limit superior of this thing? Remember what limit superior is? It is the envelope, it's the upper bound of whatever sequence we're dealing with. So the sequence we're dealing with is this, okay? F of one divided by G of one f of 2 divided by g of 2, f of 3 divided by g of 3, that is our sequence. So the question is, when, you, when n becomes like 40,000, what's going to happen? Then we have the log 2 of 40,000 divided by the square of 40,000, okay? So as it goes on, what do you think is going to happen here? We're finding the minimum of the maximums, right? So when it goes all the way to the end, okay, so imagine n to be like 2 billion, okay? The log 2 of 1 billion is about 20, no, 40. Yeah, it's about 40, 4, 0, 4, 40. But the square of, four bi of 1 billion is 1, what? Okay, we'll, we'll call it one billion square. <laughs> okay, but you get the general idea. What is 40, four zero, divided by the square of one billion? Practically that, right? So that means this whole thing is gonna give you a zero. So the only remaining question is, is zero less than infinity? Yes, I would say so. So that means it is. F of n, in this case, is a member of big O of G of n. In other words, G of n, or n squared, is an upper bound of the log of n. But is that useful information? It's not useful information at all. So, so now, if you're looking at, if g of n is n squared, okay, which is what we have here, then you can ask, is the actual time complexity of bubble sort a member of big O of n squared? The answer is yes, okay? That's pretty clear because it really is proportional to n squared. But then you can also pick the smartest sorting algorithm. Like, you know, my personal favorite is merge sort, which is n times log n. So if you ask, is n times log n, which becomes my f of n now, is that a member of big O of n squared? The answer is still yes. So if you choose a g of n that is a gross overestimate of whatever you are trying to estimate, then it doesn't give you any information at all. Just because f of n is a member of g of n doesn't mean anything because you are grossly overestimating whatever you're estimating. Is that okay? But at this point, that's how we define big O of something. So when the next time you encounter the big O notation, remember, it is simply stating an over an uh, upper bound, but it doesn't say anything about how close that upper bound is to the original function. Are we good with that statement? Okay. So we are going to ignore negligible and skip all the way to lower bound, okay? So you look at the definition of lower bound, and then you go like, wait, tag, that seems a little bit similar to the other one, okay? We look at this one, okay? This is a big O or big Omicron, and this is your big Omega, which is the you know, basically the lower bound. So let's try to solve the same problem here. So once again, we have f of n being the log 2 of n, g of n being the square of n. And now we are asking, is f of n a member of uppercase omega of g of n? 
So let's try to answer the question. I think you guys know the answer already, right? Because we already figured out that this is zero. The limit inferior is going to be zero. The limit superior is zero. The limit inferior is also zero because the limit does exist in this case, which is also zero. Is that okay? So we are now asking, is zero greater than zero? The answer is no. So that means f of n, which is log of two of n, is not a member of big omega of the square of n. What does that mean? It means n squared is not a lower bound of the log of n. Is that okay? What if I used to what if what what if I am to flip the definitions of uh, f of n and g of n? So what if I change g f of n, which is the actual you know time complexity of of the algorithm, to be the square of n? Okay, so I'm going to change this a little bit here. This is now the actual square of n, and then g of n, which is you know an estimate function, is the log of n. So in this case, if I ask, is f of n a member of omega, uppercase omega of g of n, what do you think is the answer? Yes. To be more exact, what do you think is the limit inferior of the ratio of f of n divided by g of n in this case, as n approaches infinity? Hmm? It's going to be larger and larger. So it is infinity, okay? So, okay, I have to, <clears throat> this is the disadvantage of being short because I can't just kind of point to it unless I scroll. Okay, this portion becomes infinity because we are basically asking, as n approaches infinity, what is the square of n, n times n, divided by the log two of n? It is going to be infinity. But the question that we are asking is not whether it's infinity or not. We're asking, is that greater than zero? I think you guys can all go like, yeah, it's going to be greater than zero. Is that okay? But this lower bound is also not very meaningful because it is a gross lower bound. So we got the upper bound, we got the lower bound. The upper bound can be grossly overestimating. The lower bound can be grossly underestimating. So what do you think would be nice to have? Hmm? Both. Very good. Okay. So we want both. But what does it mean when you said both? We want the same function to be both the upper to be the upper bound and the lower bound of whatever you're estimating. Okay, so that's you know that is tight bound. So tight bound, which is big theta, is actually what most people want to say when they refer to big omicron because it is a tight bound. So we'll take a quick look at what this means. Okay, f of n is a member of big theta of g of n, if and only if. I mean, this part is basically just saying the following is the definition of blah blah. Okay. So now we focus on just the right-hand side of the if and only if. I think we have seen this before, okay? We defined big Omicron a little bit earlier. G of n is an upper bound of f of n. That's basically what it says. I think we just saw this earlier, okay? Because what this means is G of n is, the, is a lower bound of f of n. So together with a conjunction in between, we are basically saying, oh, the same function, g of n, which is usually a very simple function, like n, n squared, log of n, n times log of n, that sort of thing, is a tight bound of the actual super complex but unnecessarily complicated function f of n. It's a tight bound. Is that okay? Yes. Because you can adjust the how far it is off using two constants. One constant for the upper bound, one constant for the lower bound. 
Yep. Um, so let me illustrate you know, what I mean by that. <clears throat> All right, so if g of n, f of n, sorry, is a member member of theta, I cannot do Greek letter here, so theta with an uppercase T is uppercase you know, Greek letter theta of g of n, then the following is true. So using the definition, um, you know, this is not using the definition, so I'm just going to use um, kind of more intuitive terms, okay? So there exists a constant K1 so that um, K1 times G of N is going to be greater than or equal to F of N hence the upper bound um, for all n greater than some constant k. Okay, we'll say k1 here. And also, there exists another constant k2, so that k2 times g of n is going to be less than or equal to f of n for all n that is greater than k2. Oops. Oh, okay, wait, I cannot use k here. Uh, we'll say n1 and n2. There we go. All right, so does that help understand, you know, does that help you understand why the same function can both be, be the upper bound and the lower bound? It's, yeah, to account for all the little things, okay, that is not, that's not clean. Okay, so I, I can give you an example. Okay, so let's just say that we are dealing with merge sort again. Okay, so merge sort, you know, the time complexity of merge sort can be a little bit um, slightly different by constant depending on the hardware. And it can have blips, you know, because you know, it depends on what is the size of a page, you know, that sort of thing. So I'm going to use red to be the actual f of n. Okay, so so it doesn't even have to be, it can be something like this, okay? That's, you know, the actual uh, f of n. And I'm going to use a different color. Let's say blue. So blue is going to be representing, you know, some k1 times n log n. So it's going to be a nice, smooth, you know, curve, okay? So that's going to be the upper bound. So that means, you know, eh, at some point it can be lower than what it really is, but after a certain point, it's always going to be greater than the actual value. Is that okay? So it is an upper bound. You know, the blue line is an upper bound, and you go like, but wait, tack, you know, there are some red stuff, you know, that is above the blue line. That's okay, because all I need to claim is at some point, after this point here, the blue line is always going to be greater than you know, the, the red line. That's all I need, okay? I don't need it to be always. I just need to find a point in, t in the sequence such that after that point, it's always going to be bigger. Are we good so far? So let me see if I can find another color. They typically stock different colors. Yep, there we go, green. So we'll use green to represent the lower bound, which is K2 times G of N. So that's going to be this line here. And I'm going to make it so that initially it can be above, but eventually it's, all going, to, it's going to be under. Is that okay? So the only difference between the blue line and the green line is one is using K1, to multiply to n log n. The other one is using k2 to multiply to log n log n. So that's why the blue and the green line, they're both really smooth because they are just really n log n. The red line is representing the actual time taken by the algorithm to solve a problem of n. And it's not necessarily smooth, you know, because it depends on, once again, you know, how big is your cache, uh, how much, uh, what is, how much memory is transfers for each burst mode transfer in DDR? 
how many cores you have, and so on and so forth. Okay, a whole bunch of factors. You know, so that's why it's not necessarily really smooth. But what I really care is after a certain point for the blue line, and after a certain point for the green line. The blue line is always on top. The green line is always under the actual red line. And the only difference between the blue and the green line is they are multiplied. They're, they, they're basically the same function and log n in this case, multiplied by a different coefficient. That makes n log n a tight bound for whatever the red curve is representing. So does that help answer the question? OK. So the tight bound is what we really, really want, okay? Because the blue line, which is not in this case, but the upper bound, is pretty easy. We can grossly overestimate, which means, technically speaking, if your professor at a different class is asking you, what is the big O of um, some you know, crazy sorting algorithm, okay? Maybe selection sort, okay? And you cannot remember what it is. But you remember it is some, it's either n squared or n cubed. Okay, let's say that's all you can remember. You can always be safe and write down n to the power of four. And technically speaking, using the definition of big Omicron, your professor cannot mark you down because it is an overestimate. It is a upper bound of the actual time complexity. But obviously, in most cases, your professor actually meant to ask what is big theta of the time complexity of an algorithm. But if they use the wrong notation and use big Omicron instead, then you can arguably use an gross overestimate as an answer. Obviously, don't quote me when you move on to the four-year university taking that class usually called the analysis of algorithms. That's when you get to play with these numbers and kind of <clears throat> split hair and find out, okay, so which one do you want? Do you want the big O or do you want big theta? Yes. So just to clarify, mm -hmm. why the cells upper bounds and lower bounds are not that useful simply because of the gross overestimate to underestimate? It can be, it can still be useful because let's, say, let's just say that, you know, you, you, you can go through the math to prove that um, the actual time complexity is going to be somewhere less than n cubed, okay? You don't know how much, okay? But you know it's gonna be less than n cubed. That still gives you some information, you know, because you know, if, when you compare that to something that has n factorial, the n cubed is like pff, easy choice. So as long as it gives you enough information to make a decision between two algorithms, I would still say it is still useful. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you know, the tight bound may not be easy to derive mathematically speaking. So to get a closed form and make it a tight bound may not always be easy. Um, but sometimes you may not really care because you are, you're only comparing two algorithms. One is guaranteed to have a lower bound that is already higher than the upper bound of the other one, easy choice. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it, it is not necessarily the case that you want to find a tight bound, but when we publish you know, uh, the big O notation, okay, let me, let me actually go to the website and show you what I mean by that. Most of the well-known algorithms have a tight bound. So when you go to Wikipedia, Wikipedia, <clears throat> and then you look up, you know, bubble sort, okay, bubble sort, and it will give you the time complexity, so let's see. So this is with parallel processing, and right here, worst case performance, best case performance, so they are not using Omicron, correctly in these cases. Um, they should have used uh, big theta, at least for a few of these things. <clears throat> so, so a lot of times you know, it's, a, it's a misnomer. In other words, not every source makes use of big omicron, big omega, and big theta correctly, at least not according to 
how they're defined in this class. <clears throat> so are we are we good so far? Okay. So why do you think this stuff is useful to you? You know, since you're in computer science, I would imagine that many of you want to become a software engineer or a developer of sorts. Okay, so why is this important? Why is this topic important? It allows you to choose algorithms that are more efficient for certain problems. Exactly. And why is that important? <laughs> What happens if you do not choose wisely? Uh, your program could run slow. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not by a lot, but it could be. By a lot. Yeah, yes. Lot. I, I will tell you it is by a lot. Okay. <laughs> um, and so by choosing more efficient algorithms over the other for a given problem, mm -hmm. you can just have a more efficient program. Yep. And you have a higher chance of keeping your employment as a result. Okay, I got to share a story with you guys. I know, you know, I digress a lot in my classes, but I think it helps to understand why these things are important. <clears throat> when I wrote my dissertation, that was a long time ago. Um, it was, let me try to remember. I think I started to write my dissertation sometime, somewhere around 94, 93, at the end of 93 or so, which means it's before most of you are born. Okay, so I had this, uh, Laptop computer, it was a Lenovo, but it was branded as an IBM ThinkPad. It was clunky. It's about this thick, like two inches thick. Had, had a monochrome screen and a 10 megabyte hard drive. You heard me right, 10 megabytes. Yes, your phone, your watch has more storage than my entire laptop computer. And it costed about $1,500. And we are talking about $1,993. Okay, so it was expensive. <clears throat> anyway, I installed Word, Microsoft Word 2.0 on that computer to write my dissertation. So when you write a dissertation or anything like that, you have a lot of cross-references, which means you know at one point you go like, okay, the theorem was proved in section blah, blah, blah. Okay, or you have a future reference of you know, this, ex this will be further explored in section blah, blah, blah. You know, you know, somewhere else. <clears throat> the program worked fine as I worked on my dissertation, and my dissertation was not even long. Okay, the whole thing was 100 and something pages, which is not long. Double spaced, you know, 10, 12 point font, okay? At some point, you know, there was, a, there was clearly a point, it reached the point where it took significantly longer to save the file. So I go like, okay, you know, that's okay, I'll just go ahead and do something else as the file was being saved. It wasn't because of the hard drive, okay? The hard drive you know, ind indicator was, wasn't lit the entire time. It was, for whatever reason, you know, Word was thinking. But it came to one particular point when it just could not save the file. I would give it like a whole day and it's still churning and it's not coming back. So I'm certain that somebody used an algorithm that simply does not scale up with the number of cross references. Because I have opened large documents with Microsoft you know, Word 2.0, not a problem. As long as, as it doesn't have a whole lot of cross referencing, it's not a problem. So I'm, I'm fairly certain that you know, the, the resolution of the cross references was using a very, very inefficient algorithm. And as a result, the software was basically unusable until they released Word 6.0 which is actually the next version. Don't ask me why they jumped from version two all the way to version six, but that's what happened. <laughs> um, yes, so the choice of algorithm is very, very important. And you know, even if you don't write the algorithm itself, you need to understand what algorithm is the software using when it says, okay, call this method on array and it will sort it for you. Well, okay, as tempted as you may be to go like, okay, I'm just gonna say dot sort, okay? You know, because it's a method of an array. You might wanna double check what is the actual algorithm being used because if it's using a very slow algorithm like bubble sort or insertion sort or selection sort, 
you might want to write your own algorithm just to make sure that it can do it quickly. Does it make sense? Okay, all right. <clears throat> cool. All right, so let's go back to our little slide here and see what else we have. Okay, that shouldn't be a whole lot more. I mean, this is actually literally the end of the entire slide. Type bound and what we have learned. So if f of n is the time complexity of an algorithm, which means that's the actual amount of time, if possible, we want to show that f of n has a type bound of big theta of something. Otherwise, we want to find a simple function g of n so that we can find at least the upper bound, okay, which means it's no worse than this. Okay? It may be overestimating, hopefully just a little bit, but it's no worse than that. Showing that f of n is, has a lower bound is typically not very useful unless the lower bound of one algorithm is already bigger than the upper bound of another algorithm. So in that case, it's an easy choice, right? Because if the lower bound of one algorithm is already larger than the upper bound of another algorithm, there's no reason to choose the one that has a the, the high lower bound. Um, showing that you know this is low this is lowercase omega means you know g of n is somewhat useless because you know time com in the time complexity estimate because we are looking for uh, these two cases one is called negligible that's when we use lowercase omicron and then the other one is called dominant and that's when we use you know, lowercase uh, omega both are not particularly useful. And that's why you don't get to see them most of the time. When you look at the literature that compares algorithm, they don't refer to the lower case um, Omicron nor Omega because they're typically not very useful. So are we good with this entire module at this point? Okay. So specifically, if I give you an actual sequence and say everything after this is going to alternate between these two numbers, or everything after this is going to be a particular number. Can you find the limit superior and the limit inferior? Do you know how to do that? So that becomes the next question. Well, which means you know I can give you a homework assignment for that. Just to make sure that you guys know how to do it, right? Okay. All right. So now we are moving on a little bit to the next topic in this sequence. We still have about five minutes. And five minutes is a lot of time. If I can get back into Canvas first. Right, there we go. So the next topic is called recursive definitions and algorithms. I'm going to put it here because this is getting recorded. There we go. All right, so the question is, why is recursion so important? Well, the answer is, in order to analyze the time complexity of algorithms, there is a particular way that depends on recursive definitions. So if you can cast an algorithm into a recursive definition, there are easy ways to analyze the time complexity. So that's why. But the second question is, do we, can we force an algorithm to be expressed recursively? So with only five minutes remaining, I'll give you some examples, okay? Just so that you, know, you can kind of go over the example over the weekend, and then we can talk about this next week. So this is one of my favorite is um, string length, okay? How do you find the length of a string? So typically it is unsigned, string length, const char. This is the pointer to the first character of the string, all right? So there are many ways to do this. Uh, one way to do this is to have a const char uh, old pointer, and then you say old pointer equals to p, and then you say as long as whatever p is pointing to is non-null, increment p, and then you just return the difference, which is your p, which is which should be at least as much as what old p is pointing to, minus old p. So this is one way to find the length of a string, okay? Using pointer arithmetic without using arrays at all. And it is not recursive. 
So what about a recursive algorithm to do exactly the same thing? So the way about recursive algorithm is in a certain way, it is easier. Because basically what you are forced to ask is, give me a lazy case, okay, that, so that I don't have to do a single thing. I can return the answer like right now. I can tell you right now, blah, 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 okay? And typically, I do not like this style of programming, which is you know, putting a return inside a branch of a conditional statement. But I'm gonna, I would do it here just to emphasize the ease of this approach. It's like, if blah, 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 I know what the answer is, like that. So what do you think that case is? When the string is empty, right? So how do I know a string is empty? The only thing you can depend on is P and what it points to. Go ahead. That's right, okay, which can be expressed like that. Okay, so that means the only case I go like, uh, okay, I got stuff to do, is this one. But if you get to the else case, it means whatever P is pointing to is not null. Okay, or in C++ term, that. Okay, so that means there's at least one character. Then you go like, okay, cool. Return one. Wait, that's just the character that I see. What about the rest of the string? But I'm too lazy to find out. I'm gonna have someone else to find that out. So I'm gonna call string length again. The question is what parameter do you pass to string length? No, the rest, P plus one, that is correct. Yep, there we go. So that's recursion, okay? So in a very interesting way, recursion is, in, at least in my mind, easier to figure out than the iterative approach. Because all I have to say is, can I break this problem down to one little thing that I have to do, but then the rest of it is exactly the same nature as what I'm to trying to solve, but the problem is smaller, okay? So when you look at this, you go like, hmm, attack, the recursive solution is longer, and, and as a result, it's not as good. Well, I'll give you a very short you know, version of the recursive solution. And if you're in CISP 310, you'll see this again because I can use ternary expression. If whatever P is pointing to is not null, then I return one plus string length of P plus one. Otherwise, I just return to zero. How's that for short? <laughs> now, this is not the reason why recursive algorithms is really useful, okay? It is a little bit cryptic this way, but recursion and proof by induction kind of goes hand in hand. What is proof by induction again? What, what are the two steps? Okay, just generally speaking, what are the two steps of proof by induction? There's the base case of mm -hmm. proof by induction and then the induction step, which is the element following the base case. Yep. So do we see a base case here on this one single line? There's one portion is a base case. Where, where's the base case? returning a zero. So the first question you ask is, is this algorithm correct to return a zero when it is pointing to a null character? Yep, because the null character is the terminator. If you're pointing to the terminator right here, the string is empty, there's nothing in it, right? What is the other step? The induction step, right? The induction step is based on the induction assumption, which means for everything shorter than this size of string, your string length works already, right? I just need to show that for any length of string, for any string of that length plus one, it would also work. So now we go like, okay, so this string is that length of that length. I take the first character out, the rest of the string is gonna be the assumption, okay? It's based on the induction assumption, so then I know this is gonna work correctly. If I add this to one, then I have the correct string length, done. So this is why proof by induction 
and recursive algorithms, they really go hand in hand. Okay, if you know how to prove something by induction, you can look at an, a, an, a recursive definition and go like, oh, okay, I know how to reason this out and check whether it's correct or not. Okay, we are running out of time, so make sure that you try to read ahead a little bit. Um, we are going to at least you know, get to graph algorithms. So, you know, I want you guys to read the graph algorithm. I know there's more stuff here that I haven't talked about yet, but go ahead and read the graph algorithm first because, you know, that's something that we, for certain, it will be in your final exam. So definitely go do that when, you know, I will spend some time on all this stuff here too. But it's really hard to ask questions about. All right. Have a nice weekend. I will see all of you next Monday. Some of you I will see tomorrow. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have a question about the definitions of supremum and